People from China, good afternoon. And people from the Netherlands, good morning. Welcome to the fourth webinar of our hydrogen webinar series. Just like last time, we will upload the video on YouTube for the Dutch audience and on Yoku for the Chinese audience. So there's always a possibility to rewatch the webinar. So we'll now start with a one and a half hours of presentation session. And afterwards will be a half an hour panel discussion. Thank you. Good morning to our Dutch audience and good afternoon to our Chinese audience. Welcome to the fourth episode of our hydrogen webinar series with a total of five webinar episodes over the course of these five weeks. My name is Fons and I'm the host of today's session. I'm from the Netherlands Innovation Network in China, Guangzhou. This webinar series is brought to you by the Netherlands Innovation Network in China, the Consulate General of the Netherlands in Guangzhou, and the UNDP. For this fourth webinar, we have an interesting program again with various speakers focusing on the Dutch and Chinese science and technology side of hydrogen. All universities and research institutes present here today are leading in hydrogen research in China and the Netherlands. We start with an opening speech by Piet Wanach, Senior Business Developer, TNO, leading research institute of the Netherlands. Then we will move on to the presentation, A Flywheel for Innovation, Next Generation Electrolyzers by Lennart van der Burg, Business Development Manager, Green Hydrogen at TNO. Afterwards, there will be an introduction on hydrogen and fuel cell related research by Dr. Yu Hongmei, researcher Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics Chinese Academy of Sciences. Following Yu Hongmei, there will be a presentation on hydrogen fuel cell system and emission reduction from research to application by P.V. Aravin, Professor, Energy and Sustainability Research Institute, Universiteit Groningen. Professor and Doctoral Supervisor, Tongji University School of Automotive Studies, Zhang Chunman, will be next with his presentation, Hydrogen on the Yangtze River, Project Experience in Tongling. Our last presentation will be a research sharing by Dr. Matteo Gazzani, Assistant Professor, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Same as last week, there is the possibility to ask questions via the chat. There's a live connection with the different speakers, and while the webinar is progressing, they can already respond to messages in the chat. But at the end of all presentation session, there will also be a live Q&A session with a simultaneous translator. We really recommend everybody to already type your questions in the Q&A during the webinar. So our translator already has the opportunity to provide us with a translation before the start of the Q&A session. If you wait with typing your question till the end of the presentation session, chances are that we're not able to address your inquiries during the Q&A session. Thank you. We are now transferring to Piet Warner, Senior Business Developer at TNO with his opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, ni hao. I'm honored to address you in the opening speech of this fourth webinar. I work for TNO, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research in the Unit Energy Transition for the Department of Wind Energy. Until 2018, we were active under the name of ECN. Together with our colleagues in other departments, such as Leonard van der Burg, who will present after this short speech, we do research on tomorrow's technology in order to enable the global energy transition. While Leonard and his team are more focusing on hydrogen production, we are very much looking into system integration of large volumes of both offshore and onshore produced wind energy. Already, we can quite accurately forecast the wind profile over the upcoming day, but we cannot make the wind blow constantly throughout the year. It is what it is. Everybody in the previous webinars has already therefore concluded that conversion and storage are among the answers. Our research today is very much aiming at optimal integration of wind energy and hydrogen production. That can either be through centralized hydrogen production in large plants, which are still fed by electricity cables, or potentially we can also do that in an optimized wind turbine 
which is fully designed to generate a maximum quantity of hydrogen driven by the rotor of the wind turbine. We will build this hydrogen wind turbine with our research partners this year on our test site in Meeringmeer, the Netherlands. This kind of wind turbine would then in the future no longer inject its output into electricity cables, but into pipelines running towards the industry centers and cities consuming the energy. Cables cannot store energy. Pipelines, however, they can by adjusting the gas pressure inside the pipeline. We do not have all the answers yet, but smart scientists all over the world, and of course also in China and in the Netherlands, are bringing about new knowledge in technology that will make the world greener and the sky bluer. Already we are working side by side with the large wind turbine manufacturers of China to create solutions, and we are open for other collaborations. Please enjoy the remainders of this series of webinars. Shesheni. Thank you, Piet Warner. Then we continue straight to Lennart van der Burg, Business Development Manager, Green Hydrogen at TNO, with his presentation, A Flywheel for Innovation, Next Generation Electrolyzers. Hello, welcome uh, in this hydrogen webinar series. Last time I talked about the scaling up the electrolysis toward the gigawatt scale and the road march towards 2030. This time I will talk about the next generation of water electrolyzers. My name, name is Lennart van der Burg, working at Tino, the Applied Research Institute in the Netherlands. And yeah, as the last slide showed, we want to be a flywheel for innovation. So actually accelerate thinking of new ideas bring it to the lab and scaling it up in practice because our, our main purpose is creating impact, impact for society, impact to, to reach uh, our climate goals. And that's the main driver of, um, of uh, our unit energy transition, making our lives more sustainable. Tino uh, are, diff uh, are, uh, are organized in different units. And the interesting thing is hydrogen is becoming active in all the different units. More than 50 research groups are now working on the different aspects on hydrogen in the field of transportation, in the field of industry, in the field of even in the field of defense or circularity in food. So hydrogen is getting a major position in the, the research uh, within TNO. Uh, uh, something about TNO, we are spread around the Netherlands in uh, multiple locations. Actually, the, the main uh, electrolysis research is in a location in Pette. Uh, and yeah, we also have a number of locations uh, internationally to support Dutch companies and our research projects uh, uh, in Europe and also overseas. Hydrogen. Uh, and as stated here, hydrogen will, will, is a key for the energy transition. As Tino, we developed a program on that and here are stated the main drivers for hydrogen, clean hydrogen. And uh, I, I will go through it shortly. Main reason is unlock the potential of renewable energy, of the renewable electricity. The huge amount of wind offshore, the potential of solar. I mean, what we can use directly with electricity, we should use directly with electricity, but uh, to a certain, uh, if we go really up to a, a gigawatt, 10, 15 kilowatt, uh, gigawatt level on the North Sea, we need to convert it partly to hydrogen in order to to transport it and to store it in our energy system. And that's directly the second point. Seasonal storage will be really important. I mean, now we've got fossil energy providing our, our seasonal storage in winter days in Europe, but hydrogen will be, uh, um, will be replacing that, let's say. And the third and fourth point is really about, we need to find an alternative for the heavy industry, for, the, uh, for high temperatures in the industry, or for the maritime and aviation. We need alternative uh, energy carriers, uh, carriers and hydrogen can really play a role in that. As Tino, we work on more than 50 projects uh, in multiple facilities, actually stimulating this development. Um, and we're organized around the complete supply chain. So we're looking at production, we're looking at infrastructure, we're looking at storage, and also in the end use, uh, use it. So the hydrogen can be used in a fuel cell, in, in a truck, or, uh, or even in a, in a ship but also we can use in the aviation, combined with direct air capture, you can produce synthetic kerosene, and also uh, application in the, in the industry. And important to what I just mentioned, we're really looking at where is hydrogen um, 
best position? Uh, where, where, can, where can we use electricity directly or where is hydrogen really the solution? In this presentation, I really focus on mainly uh, hydrogen production by electrolysis. The four main challenges of electrolyzers are just standing here. Obviously, as is in all new technology, it's about cost reduction, cost reduction of the, of, the, of the stack of the complete system. The second one is on, on the industrialization. Our, I mean, all electrolyzer stacks are now are hand milled, built project by project by project. Uh, we need to uh, go from project to product. We need to standardize the, the electrolyzer stacks in order to get to high volume manufacturing of these electrolyzer stacks. Obviously, you need more renewable electricity because producing hydrogen uh, by electrolysis only makes sense to use renewable electricity um, in order to get uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, reduce the CO2 emissions. And another important thing is to, we need to look at a circular design of this electrolyzer because beside the energy transition, circularity is really an important. Uh, point and also the availability of, of materials. And here in this table we showed which materi materials uh, are used in the electrolyzer uh, stacks now and which are really scarce materials where we really need to look at. And this is where our research researchers really get uh, enthusiastic about. I mean, we are really doing innovation on the component level. We want to develop the best components with the lowest cost and the highest lifetime. Uh, and that's always always a trade-off because, uh, for example, if you make a membrane really thin, um, it will have effect of your durability. So this trade-off is something where we're constantly look at, looking at on a component level and also the integ integration of that material into the electrolyzer stack. Something about the business case. From um, yeah, w what's the current price of producing green hydrogen and what are the main costs? Parameters. This is a business case, uh, a reference case for electrolysis, and the two obviously two main components: the capex, the investment of the actual electrolyzer stack, and the opex cost, which is mainly electricity. And one of the conclusion you can see in this uh, picture is that the electricity price mainly is the main factor determining the cost for hydrogen. Here, saying around four four euro. Assuming a, a stack of 1,000 euro a kilowatt and electricity price of around 50 euro. Um, but one thing which is not included in this 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 business case is the factor um, the utilization rate. I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, I mean an electrolyzer should only run on renewable electricity. And for example, in the North Sea, we have let's say 3,500 full load hours of wind energy on the North Sea. And then the solar in the in, in Netherlands or in Europe is somewhere between two, uh, three, 4,000 hours where we, can, uh, where we have the renewable electricity available. So the electrolyzer won't run continuously 8,000 hours. I mean, the first project probably will, uh, but in the end, we want to have them run only on uh, green electricity. And then the, the picture is a bit different because in the, in the bar you see here, when you run a system on 8,000 hours, 2,000 hours, you see the capex cost, so the cost of the electrolyzer stacks will become much more important. If you run it lower than 4,000 hours even, the capex will be the main cost component in your total business case. So reduction of the capex, which is here in light blue, is really important, if you can see here. So that's cost reduction. Obviously, there's also, an, uh, on the other side, a great potential of increased profit. So uh, uh, multiple hi uh, hydrogen markets, valorizing your waste heat or, or your oxygen, or um, uh, earning your money on balancing the, on the electricity grid. So that's also a nice upside. But the message of this, this graph is cost reduction is really necessary to make uh, uh, flexible use of elect uh, electrolyzer possible. Now we dive into the different technologies. Uh, in here you see the four main electrolyzer technologies. Obviously the alkaline technology that, that's already available for over 100 years. Large system has been built uh, over 100 megawatt and that's really uh, existing proving te technology. The PEM system um, um, is a technology which, which is, is uh, a lot of research effort are, are, has been done on that technology the last 
10 years and now the first projects are being built on a 5 or 10 megawatt scale. Uh, and it's really um, uh, an interesting technology to, to look at. If we go lower, then we are more on the, the upcoming technologies, let's say. The solid oxide electrolyzer uh, systems are built up to a megawatt. And the difference between the, the, those, this is a low temperature, so operating at 80 degrees. The solid oxide electrolyzer operating at 800 degrees. So a higher temperature, but also creating higher efficiency. And then an upcoming also is the IM electrolyzer, which actually combines the benefits of both the PEM and alkaline electrolyzer. I just said it already, but let's look a bit deeper into the, the different technologies and their benefits. Uh, here, it's, it's uh, um, simply explained the different technologies. And uh, here, we ma made a simple comparison of the, of, of, on a, a number of parameters from where is the technology actually standing towards each other. Uh, and obviously, I mean, uh, this is too simplified. I mean, there are much more uh, um, uh, uh, arguments under it uh, for comparison, but but uh, and as Tino, we're really st studying and looking at more detail. But these are parameters where companies and end users really looking at the maturity of the technology, the efficiency, uh, the stack lifetime is really important. Are, are we reaching 80,000 hours, or can we go maybe to 120 or 140,000 hours of lifetime? The simplicity is really an interesting one if we really go to high volume manufacturing, because if we want to manufacture uh, a thousand or hundred thousand or million stacks, the simplicity of design is really important to get to a high volume manufacturing. And there the PEM is really in, uh, advantage then up to the, the alkaline, which is a, a system with, which is a, bit, a larger, larger footprint as, uh, as stated here, but less compact, let's say. And also the response time, so how fast can it go on and off is really important because if you want to, arc, if you connect your electrolyzer to the renewable electricity system, uh, yeah, you need to to go on and off on, on a on a um, uh, on a fast speed, let's say. So in this analyzer, PEM uh, has the highest scores, but uh, to be honest, it's really a competition. It's really a competition nowadays. If we talk about the first project, is a competition between the PEM and alkaline technology, and this is a graph nicely shows. Uh, what researchers, are say, researchers, what the independent researchers are saying about the cost targets for the different technology and what are the manufacturers are saying. And obviously, only looking at the cost, which is here the parameter alkaline is in favor. So the, 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 the largest systems which will be built will be alkaline, but the PEM is really going uh, drop down in cost. Uh, and somewhere in the coming years, it may be uh, join, joining together, but it's... Um, it's really a, co a competition uh, up to now, which, which I think is good, because um, um, in the end we want to have uh, uh, um, we need to have green uh, hydrogen available at the low cost at the circular design of electrolyzer system. So I think uh, we uh, it's good to have different technologies in the, in the market. This is a really interesting thing about the learning curve. So how fast uh, can we learn in the development? And here we looked at all different technologies, solar, uh, batteries, heat pumps. And uh, one of the conclusions from our research is from how small are the unit size, how fast the learning rate. And here you see an alkaline stack of uh, uh, um, half a megawatt. And we're looking at the learning rate of 80%, 18%. And for PEM, uh, the learning rate later is even higher. And obviously, if you go to the unit size here are larger, but if you go to smaller unit size, for example, in the field of solar, heat pumps, the learning rates are, are, so, are higher. And this is really an important thing to, to take in mind in, in your strategy on, on the product development. And that's also a question is, should we build larger stacks or should we make smaller stacks which are easily manufacturable? So if we look a bit more into the electrolyzer stacks themselves, I mean, this is a, a buildup of, of a PEM electrolyzer stacks. And what are the cost of the different components in the electrolyzer stack? I mean, you've got the bipolar plate on the side. You've got the membrane in between. You've got the catalyst uh, connected to the to membrane, making the membrane electrode assembly. And what are, are really the cost driver of the stack? And this, this study nicely show that the membrane or the catalyst coated membrane actually uh, is, is now the, the, the major cost component in the stack. So here, a lot of uh, um, cost reduction can be gained. Uh, and important to mention as well, here, we, this study really look at conventional materials. 
I mean, as you know, we're looking at new materials, new innovations uh, to replace the current uh, uh, components and materials, and we can even uh, go to a much lower cost reduction of these electrolyzer stacks. I mentioned it already early that a circular design uh, is crucial. And the reason why I was saying that is that, uh, for example, with alkaline, but also, but more, even more on the PEM electrolyzer stack, is we're making use of iridium and platinum. And that's one of the PGMs, the, the, the scarce materials worldwide. And we did an analyze on the availability of that, the, the, these precious metals. And um, if we really go to a gigawatt level, there won't be enough of that material. So, so we have a strategy in reducing the catalyst loading. We're looking definitely at the alternative, but we're also looking at a circular design and recycling options so that we can gain the iridium platinum outside out the electrolyzer stack and re reuse it again, because we really need to find an uh, answer on the, on, the, on, the, on the availability of the materials used in electrolyzer stacks. One thing about what I just talked about a lot about what what are electrolysis. But water electrolysis is actually just the beginning. The next step is co-electrolysis. So we're not only making hydrogen, but we make directly chemicals. So, uh, we, wa uh, so water is going in, but also maybe CO2 coming in, and a project which can go out is also like a hydrocarbon, uh, maybe a syngas. And this is something where within the Voltagen program we work on, uh, can, we make, uh, can we make use of the innovation, the rapid innovation now in the field of water electrolysis, and can we use the innovation in co-electrolysis and looking to all different power to x options to make directly new uh, um, um, commodity, commodity chemicals and also fine chemicals. So that's something we uh, really look, look into. Uh, going to a bit more the, the research uh, done within TNO, um, we're doing a lot of uh, pilot and demonstration. And here you see a project where we connecting an electrolyzer towards a wind turbine, towards a so solar park, and see how it behaves on a dynamic response, and how we can optimize the solar production, the wind production, and the electrolyzer in that optimal way, uh, which, which is uh, beneficial for, the, for the, the business case of the operator, let's say. Um, in the last webinar, I showed already this graph. Uh, this is a really important one. I mean, now we, we're scaling up current technology. But uh, for the next generation electrolyzer, we need to go towards new stack designs, complete new stack designs. We need to optimize the, the systems. We need to look, find alternatives for the iridium. We need high preci pre pre precision manufacturing to reduce costs. So these are lines where we're working on, on different TRL levels, so different level of, of, uh, of maturity, let's say, where we work on together with, with the industry to really get cost reduction and to really to, to, to find an uh, innovative way um, yeah, how, how we can do the cost reduction, high volume manufacturing. So also looking here at the IM electrolyzer, the high temperature solid oxide electrolyzer, which uh, yeah, can compete to the, to the PEM and alkaline as well. Where are we doing this? Uh, if you have a chance, please visit the, the, the Faraday Lab in Petter. There we now uh, nearly finishing building the Europe's largest hydrogen facility. We can re re do, we do research on a, on a square centimeter level in different electrolyzer stack and really understanding from how the material, how the components behave in, in that stack and also uh, doing prediction on uh, the lifetime and the uh, performance of the, the materials uh, and how we can improve it. And that's on a, on a square centimeter level. We're now building in, in, the, in the hydro up together with ISPT in Groningen a system where we're not doing it on a square centimeter, but we do it on a 50 by 50 system. That's really an initial electrolyzer stack, and then we can really see how, it's, how the component, how the materials are behaving in, um, on the industrial scale. And then third parties can deliver their components, their materials, and see how we can optimize the electrolyzer stack. And also we can uh, include stack from third parties. So that's, that's the facilities of TNO. Uh, so we're doing a few research in the electrolyzer uh, itself. We're doing research on, on manufacturing of the different components and also the application, also in, in the industry, uh, where we're looking at the hygiene, but also the downstream processes. And obviously, they now have a lot of competences in the field of materials, electrochemistry, validation, um, 
So we, uh, the, the interesting thing in our program is that we're combining, combining the, the knowledge from the energy domain, from the industry domain, the material domain, bringing that knowledge together and working on the next generation uh, electrolyzers. And uh, yeah, I just showed this picture. It's all about implementation uh, of the, the, uh, the, 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 the technology we are developing into, the, into practice. And this is a really nice example where we built in, actually in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, a field lab where third parties can, can bring their technology, uh, demonstrate it in a real industrial area and see how it be behaves. And we can really also look at the, in the integration. So connecting uh, water electrolysis towards uh, making e-fuels on that, this specific site or making methanol on the industrial scale. So, so we, 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 our objective is starting in a lab and go as fast as possible towards a field lab, demonstrate it, and then making a product out of it and together with the industry, make the clean, clean hydrogen technology available um, uh, for Europe uh, and uh, worldwide. So this was my presentation. Uh, I talked about the next generation electrolyzer. If you have any question or you want to join our hydrogen innovation program, please go to Tino dot com slash hydrogen or contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lennart van der Berg. Remember, all the speakers are present live and are already able to answer any questions via the chat. Thanks again, Lennart van der Berg. Then we now move on to the next speaker, that is Yu Hongmei, researcher at Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics, Chinese Academy of Science with her introduction on hydrogen and fuel cell related research. Hey, hello. Uh, hello. 首先介绍一下我们这个单位吧一直是在中国科学院一百个左右的研究所里面位居前列的主要包括了几大部分 那么我今天在这里跟大家分享的，呃，我英文因为和荷兰方面来交流，我们简称为呃hydrogen cell。那么大家知道电解和燃料电池是相互可逆的一个过程，那一方面呢是利用外界的电把这个水分解成氢和氧，那么在需要电的时候呢再把氢和氧复合发电变成生成水，这样呢整个起来呢是一个呃不涉及
那么从一九七零年开始，七十年代开始呢，话所的燃料电池呢，经过了将近五十年的一个研发，最开始呢就是一个碱性燃料电池。这个碱性燃料电池呢，呃，是以氢氧化钾为电解液的燃料电池，分别用于在轨的卫星和载人的飞行。那么，呃，随着九十年代质子降分膜的一个发展，呃，大连话所在碱性燃料电池的基础上呢，又开始了质子降分膜燃料电池的研发。那么这个研发呢，包括了催化剂、膜、膜电极、双极板、电堆以及燃料电池系统这诸多的几个方面。那么从里程碑的角度来看，从两千年开始，大连化学所就陆续的有标志性的成果出来。那么第一个燃料电池中巴在国内的是在两千年在湖北实验进行运行的，上面就采用了大连化学所研制的三十千瓦氢氧燃料电池。嗯，电堆当时是，呃，五千瓦一个电堆，一共用了六个电堆。后继的就在呃两千零八年的北京奥运会，以及两千一零年的嗯上海世博会，以及后续的二零一三年的这个新加坡的一个青年世锦赛，分别应用了这个呃大连化所技术研制的燃料电池、电堆和系统。那么分别它的这个制造方呢是这个大连新源动力有限公司。那么，大连新源动力有限公司最初是采用了大连化所的燃料电池技术，是这样。那么近几年来，随着燃料电池的这个不断推广，人们就是想降低燃料电池的成本。最核心的一个问题就是燃料电池里面的钴含量太高，这样的话就限制了它的应用和这个价格。那么在这方面呢，我们从电化学的角度分析呢，我们把这个问题分成几部分。一个是这个燃料电池里面的活化极化，也就是催化剂相关；再一个呢，就是欧姆极化，是这个，呃，膜和电池材料相关；再一个是传指极化，是从化工的角度设计电堆，来进行研究。那么从这几个方面呢，化学所都有一些相应的进展。那么基于质子结合膜燃料电池，在近几年来，呃，国际上又回过头来将质子结合膜燃料电池和碱液体碱性燃料电池的优点相结合，一方面呢是用这个质子交换膜燃料电池的这个固体聚合物的概念，另一方面呢在碱性燃料电池方面呢，因为碱性燃体系可以不用白金催化剂，所以呢呃碱性体系也是大家比较喜欢的，因此结合这两个工作就提出了这个 AEM 燃料电池，就是碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池。那么最近几年呢，大连化学所在这方面呢也做了一些工作。这方面的工作呢，首先是从碱性阴离子交换膜的复合膜开始，呃，做增强的碱性阴离子交换膜。那么有一个基膜，我们做这个呃碱性膜。那么这个碱性膜呢，我们可以达到一个比较理想的电导率和比较理想的这个呃呃叫 swelling ratio 这个平衡的一个关系。那么从这两个角度，可以把这个膜应用到燃料电池中。那么这样的一个技术，我们扩展起来就可以做到一个，呃，这样一个尺寸的碱性膜燃料电池。我们用这样一个尺寸的燃料电池呢，就可以进行，呃，碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池的膜电极的制备。那么这是我们制备的最右边这个图呢，是我们制备的电堆级的碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池的膜电极。那么。基于这样两个基本材料，又基于我们对碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池的研究，我们做了这个碱性阴离子交换膜的一个寿命测试。因为这个寿命测试呢，是将来无论哪一种电池进行应用的一个前提。那么我们经过了许多的这个挫折和摸爬滚打，嗯、呃，发现了水管理对碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池里面。的性能的稳定和性能的提高具有非常重要的一个作用。嗯、呃，这里时间限制呢，我就不多讲了。但是呢，我如果我们要做合作和交流的话，我们可以在这方面进行一个呃深入探讨。那么基于这样一个研究呢，材料和水管理的研究，我们分别在二零一三年和二零一六年，呃，做了两个碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池的电堆。这张图呢，就是我们研制的第一个碱性。千瓦级碱性阴离子交换膜的电堆和系统。那么在这基础上，在二零一六年呢，我们又研制了完全不用钴的碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池电堆。这个呢，国际上报道的还不是很多。
那么，针对碱性阴离子交换膜燃料电池的问题呢，我们希望把零的电极呢做得更好。这样呢，我们选两个代表性的工作在此交流。一个呢，就是说，呃，有序化的这个呃电极材料，比如说在阴极，我们用这个铜的呃纳米针系列，呃，进而在铜上面单载钵。这样呢，这个一个催化剂呢，在碱性体系中比碳载钵性能要有有一个比较大的提高。这样就给我们一个启示，就是说用这种思路呢，我们完全可以考虑在碱性阴离子交互膜燃料电池中呢，以这种材料来代替呃酸性膜，就是质子交互膜燃料电池中的碳载钵。那、嗯、这是我们质子催化剂的一些基本形貌。当然，这个可能是有点过于基础。那么基于这样一个催化剂呢，我们把它组装到单电池里，可能可以获得一个比较好的一个性能。那么另外一方面，在碱性阴离子交互膜燃料电池方面呢，呃，这个氢氧化方面，就是阳极方面催化剂呢，也是一个比较大的一个挑战。那么目前为止呢，呃，国际上还是用碳载钵作为阳极的催化剂。那在我们研究组呢，我们就探索了用这个一了纳米线作为呃阳极的催化剂。这样一个催化剂呢，可以利用。这个催化剂组合我们前面的这个阴极催化剂，呃，做一个比较好的一个电池性能。那么这个电池性能就会为我们在这个碱性阴离子交互膜燃料电池中的阳极催化剂提供一个非钵的一个选择。那么我们前面提到这个 hydrogen cell 是实际上是指的两个东西，一个是燃料电池 fuel cell， 另外一个呢就是说这个电解。那么现在的电解呢，在化学所的电解呢，我们有两方面的工作。一个呢是基于质子交互膜的电解，那么这个电解呢，大家知道，呃，与碱水的电解相比呢，它特别适合于可再生能源波动性的这个呃电能输入。那么这是我们实测的，在波动性输入的状态下，两侧压力的一个变化。那么我们可以看到，用这样一个技术呢，呃，我们可以比较好的适应波动性的这个能源输入。那么这张图呢，是我们这个研究团队。在过去的十年中，陆续推出的呃质子交互膜燃料电池，呃质子交互膜电解水的质氢的电堆，分别组装在这个一个立方米和这个嗯五个立方米的那这个电解系统里面。那么，特别是这个五个立方米的电电解系统呢，我们提供给嗯中国的国家电网的相关单位进行测试，已经运行了一年多，现在性能完好。那么在这个基础上呢，在这个呃电解的另一方面呢，我们也类似于燃料电池，着眼于未来。为了降低质子交互膜电解水制氢机的成本，我们希望把里面的质子交互膜换为碱性阴离子交互膜。那么我们做了一些前期研究，用这样一个研究呢，我们把这个里面的膜换成碱性阴离子交互膜，同时改进了这个催化剂和电极。呃，这是我们在实验室小试的这个。呃，电短堆的这个状况。那么，同时在结合燃料电池和电解质氢两方面的工作呢，我们参与了国际标准的制定。呃，我们主导的这个 IEC TC 幺零五的储能用派姆燃料电池和呃电解的这个国际标准呢，已经在二零一九年的十二月份正式发布。我们想。我们的工作呢，一方面是在实验室，另一方面呢是在工业界，将来可以得到应用。那么目前我们工业界除了新源动力在呃十几年前的这个技术转化以外，在近几年，我们的燃料电池技术分别转化给这个安徽的明天氢能科技股份有限公司。那么在二零一九年，我们的这个派姆电解技术呢，呃，许可给这个阳光电源有限公司。那么希望用这个技术呢和光伏等可再生能源结合，呃，实现绿色之氢。整个的这样一个 hydrogen cell 结合电解之氢的电堆和燃料电池这两方面，我们希望结合可再生能源，以水、氢、电为媒介，那这样让我们的整个的能源循环不涉及碳，对整个的能源体系起到一个新的探索的作用。那么也希望在这方相关的这个领域。和我们的学术界与工业界的朋友进行深入的交流。嗯，我们整个的工作呢，一方面是来自于科学院的支持，另一方面来自于科学院，呃，来自于中国科技部和国家自然基金委，呃，一并表示对这些知识的一个感谢。谢谢大家。
Thank you, Yu Hongmei, for this interesting introduction on the hydrogen and fuel cell related research. We will quickly move on to the next speaker, Aravind, Professor, Energy and Sustainability Research Institute, University of Honingen, who will present hydrogen fuel cell system and emission reduction from research to application. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aravind. I am uh, a professor of energy conversion at University of Groningen uh, in the Netherlands. But I'm also connected to uh, Technical University Delft, where I have been working till now, uh, with the Process and Energy Department uh, and also the Climate Institute of, of TU Delft. So, um, a lot of the research I present here today. We have started at UDEL, we are continuing at University of Groningen, but uh, connections with, with UDEL as well. So uh, that's the background. And uh, the focus uh, is uh, on, on uh, several areas. And uh, one is definitely hydrogen and fuel cell teaching programs. So teaching uh, very often differentiates universities from other knowledge organizations and, and, and uh, research centers. So uh, teaching is, uh, is something which we focus on. And uh, in research, uh, we actually uh, focus on uh, development of high efficiency systems uh, with, with sort of a background in power plant engineering. So uh, where to start? Uh, if we, if we uh, use hydrogen and fuel cells or other hydrogen carrying fuels and fuel cells, in, in uh, uh, power plants for different applications. Uh, you start with uh, electrochemical fuel oxidation. So that's where we also start with. We look at um, chemistry and electrochemistry of fuel oxidation, uh, electrolysis and reversible fuel cell systems. So the fuel cells which could actually also act as uh, electrolysis, stationary and mobile applications, uh, some focus on shipping, but also drones, cars, etc. And uh, fuel processing for solid oxide fuel cells. There's a lot of focus on high temperature fuel cells, uh, but not completely limited to. Um, biofuels, and, and uh, uh, again, early focus on uh, biomass gasifier, solid oxide fuel cell systems. And uh, we also look at waste to energy and, and, and resources and, and, and uh, uh, technologies for such applications. So this is generally uh, what we are working on. And let me start with teaching. Teaching, uh, we are actually um, involved in, in, in several uh, European uh, programs, well, at least two European programs now on fuel cell related teaching. And this is a program, No High, um, which I have coordinated uh, from TU Delft with several universities from, from uh, Europe, uh, and several other organizations, including companies, um, participated. So we actually developed a, 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 an innovative training program with shared laboratories, serious games, uh, online lectures, tutoring, etc., and trained several hundred technicians in, in Europe, uh, in different European languages. So um, uh, basically an e-course, uh, with a comfortable format for, for uh, technicians with practical training, serious games, tutoring, et cetera, all involved. So this is, um, uh, this is a, a project which is now finished, but we continue the activities with, uh, with uh, uh, a foundation named uh, No High Foundation, uh, which I chair and, and several uh, um, uh, members are connected to, to, the, to the foundation. And, and uh, so these activities continue. So, Teaching is something which we are very much into. So we started talking about hydrogen fuel cell technician training program, the European program, which is already finished. But uh, our ongoing activity, for example, uh, in, in development, is a new program uh, called uh, Teach High. And this is, uh, this is a program for offering full uh, MSc uh, programs in European universities. So. Uh, several courses are recorded and available online, and um, uh, European universities could offer this uh, such hydrogen fuel cell MSc programs with 
uh, a large percentage of uh, online lectures available from the program, but also mixing it up with uh, locally taught uh, courses at the universities. So um, several, some of these courses, um, not the full program, uh, will be offered uh, at University of Groningen uh, next academic year, and eventually we might offer the full MSU programs as well. So we again use innovative teaching methods uh, and for such, uh, while developing such a program, but also we have, uh, um, we have arrangements for student exchange, et cetera, et cetera, as a part of, um, as a uh, part of uh, developing a European uh, education program for hydrogen fuel cells uh, at MSE. So that's a bit teaching, uh, what we are busy with. And uh, I started with teaching because uh, universities are slightly different from other, other knowledge institutions because of our involvement uh, in teaching as well. So now let me just come to, to, to research. Um, what we do, uh, we uh, look at uh, electrochemistry of fuel oxidation with impedance spectroscopy, surface analysis, but also electrochemistry integrated CFD. And we look at high temperature gas processing for solid oxide fuel cells, stack testing, detailed system studies, well to wheel studies, system integration studies. Now, um, system thermodynamics. So, so a lot of system studies are based on uh, a, a modeling package called Cycle Tempo, uh, developed at TU Delft. And this is one of the few, maybe uh, one of the very few uh, thermodynamic modeling tools available for power plant uh, modeling with built-in fuel cell modules. So we can actually have built-in modules uh, within, uh, in cycle tempo. And we use cycle tempo to, to, to look at uh, fuel cell integrated power plants. So with that, we actually very often work with industry in many cases, not necessarily always. And an example is, uh, well, this is, um, this is a program, uh, this is a, a joint paper uh, with us and um, uh, Nuon Wattenfall, uh, one of the, the largest electricity producers in the Netherlands and Europe. And we looked at an existing 250 megawatt um, IGCC, integrated gasifier combined cycle power plant and looked at, say, um, uh, how to retrofit solid oxide fuel cells uh, in, in, in several years to come uh, to make uh, this plant, uh, to convert this plant into a, a fuel cell integrated IGCC, thereby increasing its efficiency, but also making it possible to, to um, uh, separate carbon. Carbon capture is much easier when we have electrochemical fuel oxidation with solid oxide fuel cells in, large, in such large power plants. And if we actually, and, and we have modeled the power plant and we have uh, validated the models and we had joint publications with the industry, a series of three publications uh, showing, well, um, this shows how to, to, to make use of such, uh, such modeling tools uh, to come up with innovative, ultra high efficiency power plant concepts. Uh, in, in very long run, we believe that gasified fuel cell integrated power plants could produce electric power at 70% efficiency uh, from chemical energy in, uh, in the fuel we feed it. But this plant is not really for 70% uh, efficiency, but much lower efficiencies, but it's based on, an exist based on a, a really operational um, uh, 250 megawatt IGCC. And finally, uh, we also looked at how to operate this plant with, say, 70% biomass. And if you have uh, a biomass operated IGCC, and if you have carbon capture, that's one of the interesting approaches for negative emissions power plants of the future. Okay, so then we can actually produce electric power while, um, uh, while uh, taking out uh, CO2 uh, from atmospheric air. So such innovative, highly efficient power plant concepts, developing it is, is, is uh, one of the, the knowledge lines, uh, academic lines we are busy with. Now, um, 
not only such power plants. We also look at, for example, so if you have cars, if you have a fuel cell car, your fuel cell car efficiency is very high. So if you have a car, you drive one or two hours a day, and otherwise you park it somewhere. Now, if you use a fuel cell in your parked car as a power plant, then you can actually produce uh, electric, electric power at efficiencies close to 40% or more, which is actually the average efficiency of power production in Europe. So you actually save the investment for new power plants. And if you really look at the number of cars being sold in, in the world, maybe one or two years, um, if you really replace existing cars with fuel cell cars, maybe you can actually shut down several of the power plants uh, in, in, in many countries in the world. But of course, uh, looking at such power plants, coming up with such concepts is one thing, but also we look at um, innovative process schemes for such plants. If you use natural gas, solid oxygen fuel cell could actually operate as a reformer producing hydrogen. And if we feed this hydrogen uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Kara's power plant, uh, we actually have shown in a published paper that it's possible to have very uh, high electrical efficiencies um, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, solid oxygen fuel cell act, uh, 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 acting as, as a uh, natural gas reformer, but also while producing power and using the, the, the hydrogen in the car to, to produce, uh, power, produce power in, 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 a, uh, in a fuel cell car and the efficiencies could be comparable to very highly efficient natural gas power plants as well, very much. And then again, we could actually um, uh, avoid a part of the investment because the investment in the fuel cell uh, car, uh, fuel cell in the car is already made. So these are some of the, the power plant uh, activities, power plant related research activities uh, we, we uh, take up. Now, uh, but of course, uh, looking at systems and understanding uh, system concepts and coming up with very highly efficient systems are fine. But if you're not able to engineer such systems, it's of no use. So uh, if you want to, to, to start with, um, uh, with uh, developing such power plants, you, uh, you, you look at how fuel is oxidized and how, how is the electrochemistry, how the electrode fuel combinations work from electrode level to cell level to stack level to system level. So we have all in, in our laboratory. So uh, you could see uh, electrode testation, cell testation, stack testation, a four kilowatt integrated power plant, actually one of the first in the world probably for gasifier integration and uh, gas processing systems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, so we have system modeling activities combined with uh, lab facilities and lab research. We really look at uh, fuel oxidation electrochemistry how the fuel is oxidized at electrodes. And uh, once you understand the electrochemistry, uh, take it into computation through dynamic um, uh, models in order to understand how the cell performs, et cetera, et cetera. So combining uh, these two will help us to engineer these power plants for the future. And uh, look at the detailed electrochemistry of uh, reactions taking place uh, at the electrode. And uh, for example, uh, how gas diffusion influences the, the cell performance, et cetera. And once you understand how electrodes perform, so we then um, look at contaminants, for example, with biomass uh, derived tars, if it goes to a solid oxygen, you can actually see from impedance analysis that it's possible to reform uh, tars in a solid oxygen fuel cell. Uh, otherwise, it's not easy to, to, to feed a, a tar containing uh, fuel to any other. Uh, conventional power production devices such as a gas turbine. So it doesn't mean that, okay, all the tar components could actually go to a fuel cell, but many. So that's actually a similar, uh, that's another research line we have. So influence of contaminants. And once you know the contaminants, we design, develop, and build uh, gas processing facilities in order to come up with integrated system. And, and to be used not only for power production, such, such concepts for not only for power production. For example, this is a multi-million euro project funded by Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we looked at, for example, um, uh, microwave-assisted plasma gasification of human waste uh, for, and, and uh, uh, using the same gas produced in, in a fuel cell, which produces electricity, which in turn goes back, back to the microwave uh, unit for uh, the gasification. 
we have shown initially that it could actually be an energy neutral system. But with later system thermodynamic models, we have shown that such a power plant, such a plant could actually operate as a power plant with close to 60% electrical efficiency. And these are all published uh, uh, in, 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 in papers. Um, but also looking at uh, how to achieve very high efficiencies, ultra high efficiencies. Uh, for example, uh, if you actually have heat exchange between uh, between um, uh, fuel cell and gasification in a proper way, you could actually achieve uh, electrical efficiencies, say, close to, to, to uh, 70 percent or more. We also work on the thermodynamics of all this, but in such a way that when we propose something, we understand how the system could perform. So that, that's, uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, we work on these systems in a highly connected manner working on electrochemistry and fuel oxidation, and fuel processing and system engineering one side and system thermodynamics to combine all to come up with very high efficiency uh, power plant concepts. And towards negative emissions, if you actually operate such gasifier fuel cell power plants, uh, if you uh, extract biochar from gasifier, then you can actually store it somewhere, for example, use for soil, uh, soil amendment uh, that already takes out carbon from atmospheric air when biomass is formed. And additionally, with solid oxide fuel cells automatically separates nitrogen from the combustion product so we can uh, cool down uh, the, the anode outlet, outlet, which is mostly say uh, steam and carbon dioxide, but then carbon dioxide is separated and we can store it. And this is one way to go for negative emissions power plants. If we need them in the future to stabilize as, as climate, which is probably changing too much now because of uh, the greenhouse gases. Um, other initiatives, uh, we work on electrolysis and hydrogen production, quite a lot on reversible fuel cells because you can, if you can have reversible fuels, they operate all the time. So if you have uh, a lot of solar and wind electricity produced in future, these devices could act as electrolysis producing hydrogen or a hydrogen carrying fuel. And when there's not enough sunshine, when there's not enough wind, these devices could actually produce power using the fuel which they have. So you can actually uh, use these systems always, which might make them uh, more economically viable. And we actually work on fuel cell drones, uh, fuel cells for ships, uh, biogas fuel cell systems, and uh, gasifier as well as CHP systems, together with industrial partners. Now, um, there's at least one system which has sort of uh, working in 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 a, in, a, uh, in in a laboratory where all to be commercial in the future uh, design is completed and successfully tested in Austria. So, well, if you are able to to um, demonstrate these systems in in, in a large scale, maybe the, the the group will be able to come up with such systems for the market in the near future. Uh, that's all uh, I have to, to, to convey. We look at hydrogen fuel cells from, from, from an application viewpoint, starting from electrochemistry at the electrodes, either in fuel uh, oxidation or fuel production, and then uh, highly efficient systems for uh, a variety of applications. Thank you. So that's all uh, from me. Thank you, Aravind, for this insightful presentation. Now, before we move on to the next speaker of the presentation session, I would like to kindly remind the audience to already type your questions in the Q&A session so our translator already has the opportunity to provide us with a translation before the start of the Q&A session. Thanks again, Arvind. Then, now we move on to the next speaker, which is Zhang Tsunman, Professor and Doctoral Supervisor, Tongji University School of Automotive Studies. Zhang Tsuman will share some information on their project, Development and Application of Hydrogen Energy Technology and Hydrogen-Driven Yangtze River. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Man Zhang, but from Tongli University. Today, my presentation title is about Development and Application of Hydrogen Energy Technology. There are two parts in this presentation. The first part is 
introducing the research and development activities of hydrogen energy technology in Tongji University. As early as 2005, our group successfully developed by product hydrogen purification technology and built the first demonstration system. And in 2010, we expanded this system to supply hydrogen for demo fuel vehicles during Shanghai World Expo. At the same time, we deeply studied the influence of impurity gases in hydrogen on the performance of a fuel cell. All these species, we formulated the national standard of hydrogen quality. With the rapid development of uh, renewable energy, our group began to research hydrogen production by electrolyzing water. In 26, our team developed the first power to hydrogen demo system in China and developed electrolytic technology and system control technology to adapt to power fluctuation. In addition, we also started the system economy of the power to hydrogen system. All about hydrogen storage technology is another important research direction in our group. In 2010, we developed a successful Type 3 35 MIGPA hydrogen cylinder that can be manufactured in batches and got the first manufacturing license in China. In 2014, our group also developed Type 3 70 MIGPA hydrogen cylinder and realized small batch application. Last year, we completed Type 4 70 MIGPA hydrogen cylinder prototype and manufacturing standards are being developed. To promote the technical development of China's hydrogen refueling station is another important mission of Tongji hydrogen team. So since 2004, our group has started the research of hydrogen refueling station, including hydrogen storage technology, compressing technology, and refueling technology. In 2007, we designed and developed Shanghai Anting hydrogen refueling station. And in 2008, we developed the first mobile hydrogen refueling station in China. In 2010, we developed the Shanghai World Expert Hydrogen Refueling Station and designed and built hydrogen refueling network to supply hydrogen for 173 fuel vehicles. This refueling network consists of a by-product hydrogen purification plant to fixed hydrogen refueling stations and two mobile hydrogen refueling stations. And then we started the K technology research about uh, 17 megapa hydrogen refueling station, successively developed 90 megapa compressor and 90 megapa tag and 70 make part disp dispenser and also include ele electrolysis system and then we also built the uh, 70 make part hydrogen fuel station in 2017 this station is located in Dalian Liaoning province we also developed the the station control system and the hydrogen 
qualitative risk assessment technology of hydrogen refuel station. You know, Tongzi's hydrogen group is a big deal in addition to hydrogen technology, including hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, hydrogen refueling. The fuel cell technology is also an important research direction. Our group has been working on fuel cells more than 15 years. They have successfully developed high-performance catalysts, high activity, and high durability. Membrane electrode assembly with high performance and bipolar plates and also masters the design and integration technology of a high power fuel cell stack. These materials and the components have been manufactured in batches. Besides fuel cell stack, we have also mastered the design and the integration technology of high power fuel cell engines. The second part is to introduce the hydrogen driven industrial project from Tongling, Anhui province. You know, Yaz River is origin of Chinese civilization and is very, very important for China. The Yaz River economic belt gathers more than 40% of the country's population and creates more than 40% of the country's GDP. As the largest inland waterway in China, the Yaz River is surrounded by lots of ports and more than 200,000 vessels of all kinds. However, the main power of vessels is still diesel engine with huge noise and serious pollution. Tongling is one of the 26 important northern cities of the Yaz River economic belt. It has more than 140 km river coastline of the Golden Waterway. And Tongling Port is one of the top 10 ports of the Yaz River. And a class one open point of the state. Tongling has also plentiful industrial byproduct hydrogen resources, more than 2 billion cubic meters per year which can supply enough low-cost hydrogen for future fuel cell vessels. Yeah. Last year, Tony put forward the hydrogen-driven Yaws River strategy. Gradually, transform the fossil fuel power system into hydrogen fuel cell power system. For pillar stage, we will firstly develop fuel cell ferry and fuel cell law enforcement ship. In, in the first stage, government need cultivate the fuel cell ship industries in Tongling and develop fuel cell ships less than 2,000 tons and focus on connecting the tributary waterway system of the Yangtze River around Tongling, including some famous lakes such as Fengsha Lake, Baidang Lake, and so on. In the second stage, we will develop fuel cell ships more than 5,000 tons and expand the Yacht River truck line shipping and the main branch line shipping and connect the Yacht River truck line as the main tributaries such as Jialing River, Wujiang River, and so on. In the third stage, we will develop larger power fuel cell ships, more than 10,000 tons, and realize river and sea coordinate transport, and connect the Yacht River, Pi River, Beijing Hundred Great Canal 
and other major waterways systems and will cover the vast majority of coastal and riverside provinces in China. Okay, this is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zhang Tuman, for your presentation. Then we now move on to the last speaker before the start of the Q&A session. The last speaker today is Matteo Gazzani, Assistant Professor, Utrecht University, who will share some of his hydrogen-related research. Good morning to the Dutch attendees and good afternoon to the old Chinese attendees. My name is Matteo Gazzani and I'm an Assistant Professor in Utrecht University and I'm happy to be here today to give a presentation in the great context of hydrogen. All right. More specifically, my presentation will be about uh, hydrogen in a net CO2 net zero world. What are applications and the research that we are undertaking? So let me first start with a bit of historical background. We can recognize that uh, three historical periods exist when hydrogen research and, uh, and development gained momentum. One in the 70s uh, for the oil crisis, later in the 1990s when awareness of climate change started to develop, and finally the last years where we understood that hydrogen is really key to, to move to a net CO2 net zero framework. In fact, in the 70s, it was, it was all about the security of supply, uh, transform our energy system in, in, to be autarkic. In the 1990s, uh, hydrogen was perceived as a sector-specific solution, like road transportation or power generation, while only now we, we start to we understand that uh, hydrogen will be key in different sectors, uh, and in fact, will be the key to decarbonize those sectors that are really difficult to decarbonize, like industrial manufacturing and transportation. If you look at hydrogen today, we can recognize that basically we go from fossil fuels uh, to building block for chemical industry. So mostly from natural gas, but also coal and oil. And we provide this hydrogen to refining, to ammonia manufacturing, to methanol production. This has to change, of course. and. Uh, um, and the impression is that there will be no single leading application, but uh, it will be cross-sectorial, multi-application multi use of hydrogen. Different countries uh, will follow different pathways. Uh, this will result in different balance among end uses uh, in different geographical and economical and social societal contexts. Um, and uh, for a given country, there will be one preferred end use application will then uh, spill over different sectors by 2050. Uh, if, you, if you look at end uses application, we can recognize some key ones like a ground and maritime transportation, feedstock for chemical industry, power generation, especially has a hydrogen has a way to integrate more renewables, high temperature industrial heating, and then industrial application has, for example, uh, in the integrated steelworks. A nice example is a, a project, a big research project that we we are uh, uh, we are almost uh, concluding. It's called Elegancy. There is a website here if you want to know more. And uh, in this research project, uh, uh, different countries uh, um, research how hydrogen from fossil fuels, but without emissions, so with a uh, CCS, can be used uh, to uh, go toward a net zero uh, work. Uh, for example, if you look at the Norwegians, they are interested in uh, transforming natural gas into hydrogen and uh, transport hydrogen then to continental Europe. In UK, hydrogen is uh, perceived as a key for decarbonizing industry, but also uh, residential heating. In the Netherlands, it is key for decarbonizing uh, uh, industrial clusters like the Rotterdam Harbor. Harbor. And in Germany, for example, is, uh, hydrogen is a uh, has to be coupled with uh, the massive amount of renewables that are uh, being built, built and, uh, and being developed. And finally, in Switzerland, hydrogen is perceived as a, uh, the way to go to the decarbonize uh, transportation. Now, uh, if you look at the challenges, uh, of course, we there will be uh, we have to recognize that there are many, uh, not just a single one, but an ensemble of them. So we need uh, robust conversion technologies. We need availability of large storage that also allows for cross-sectorial coupling. We need to transport hydrogen intercontinentally 
and we need an infrastructure for all this. And finally, we, we must be able to produce hydrogen with no CO2 emission, either from fossil fuel or from electricity. Now, if you look at the research uh, that we are undertaking here in Utrecht, uh, I would recognize um, uh, five different applications. So first, uh, we investigate how gas separation for hydrogen production with new processes for hydrogen CO2 separation. We look at how hydrogen behaves in the energy system, for example, by looking at underground hydrogen storage or the chain optimization for production, transmission, and use of hydrogen. We investigate how hydrogen is used as a building block in the chemical industry. And uh, we look at uh, hydrogen in the integrated steelworks. If, last but not least, we also look at how hydrogen can be used in conversion technologies like gas turbine and fuel cell. Today, I will focus on uh, uh, the process for hydrogen CO2 production and underground hydrogen storage. First, let me also complement this with a bit of uh, my research interest. So the goal of my research is really to enable the deployment of new technologies, processes, and systems for CO2-free energy molecules production. And I do this by looking at, by bridging fundamental science and technology and processes, by innovating the process synthesis, untangling the interdependencies between technologies, processes, and systems, and finally, by improving the methodology and available tools to process and system simulate. More specific, uh, these are the building blocks of my research approach. So there is characterization testing that is often carried out with uh, industrial or other uh, research uh, partners. These uh, then lead the way to modeling and process synthesis. This is a uh, first principle thermodynamic and rate-based modeling, which, has the, which is then uh, uh, provide the tools for process integration and optimization. And finally, this is a transfer to either in either pro in new pro projects or to companies in a via technology transfer. So let us start with this uh, new process for CO2 and, and hydrogen production from multi-component stream. This is particularly relevant if you look at the production of hydrogen with no CO2, where hydrogen is used for, let's say, the, the processes where purity is key. So industrial processes, ground and maritime transportation, and feedstock for chemical industry. Now, if you look at hydrogen production from fossil fuels, basically we can see four main steps. Fuel is provided, then steam gas is produced by different processes. This gas is then separated into the different usable components, and finally, those are used. And if you look at the state of the art for the separation processes, Pressure swing absorption is certainly the key, uh, the main technology for pr providing high purity hydrogen. Whenever we need also to produce high purity CO2, this for uh, either industrial purposes or for storage, therefore removing all associated emissions to the carbon in the fuel, uh, we will have a, a, a free step where we remove CO2. And this is typically done with absorption. Uh, so, chemical. Or physical absorption. What we did it was to develop a new process where these two, uh, CO2 separation and hydrogen separation, are uh, in one uh, process only. And we do this by using a vacuum pressure swing absorption. Again, uh, it's a model based process design. So we have a, a thermodynamic model that we, that we have validated experimentally, that we believe it's very robust. This is complemented by all parameters that are needed, for example, for uh, the absorption equilibrium or the physical properties. And the given uh, process conditions, so initially and boundary condition, we are then able to optimize the separation performance, so to achieve really the specifics that we need to have for the hydrogen CO2, and also make this uh, competitive in terms of energy and productivity with regards to other processes that do do the same, uh, the, the, the same job. Basically, what we did here was to develop different, different uh, vacuum pressure swing absorption cycles. Those are steps uh, that uh, um, our fixed bed experiences in time to have to be able to produce a hydrogen product and a CO2 product. And then we have uh, developed four different configurations uh, that make different use of uh, cycles, uh, um, pressure equalization steps, different vacuum conditions uh, for the product, uh, for the CO2 product. Typically, when then optimizing this uh, uh, in terms of uh, separation performance, we will obtain a Pareto front. 
for example, in terms of CO2 purity and recovery. If you want to improve the purity, you must lose in the recovery, and this is the thermodynamic of the process. And we see that uh, all four cycles behave rather well, and uh, specifically two cycles, cycle B and cycle D, are able to provide purity and recovery of CO2 that is in the interest, in the, in the interesting uh, condition. We can do the same for hydrogen, and uh, we can see that all cycles that we have developed are able to provide hydrogen that is very high purity, above 95%, and even going to 99.9%, with a very interesting uh, recovery, so all above 90%. Right, so we have developed a, a process that is able to provide CO2 and, and hydrogen in the, in the specifics uh, um, that are required for the, for the processes, but does it make sense when we compare this to the state of the art? And then we have, in fact, to compare with the, the existing process. And we have compared the vacuum pressure swing absorption with uh, uh, the state of the art that is, uh, as I said, absorption, especially activated uh, MDA, and pressure swing absorption for, for hydrogen. We see this here uh, in the term of exergy needed for the separation and the productivity. This gray area is the exergy needs of the activated MDA process with a, uh, uh, an area here that is valid for the, the shell project uh, uh, in, uh, in Canada. And we can see that our process, again, is defined with these Pareto curves in terms of exergen productivity. And we can appreciate that uh, thanks to the fact that we bring two processes in one, we more than we, we double or more the productivity. We pay, we pay this a bit in terms of exergy, but eventually we see that there are working points where the activity is really close or competitive with the activated MDA. Very good, let's now move to the second uh, application I want to discuss, underground hydrogen storage. This will be, for example, relevant when, of course, uh, discussing the challenge of availability of large storage and uh, specifically for power generation. So how we can uh, store hydrogen to use in moment of time where renewables are not available. There are essentially two possibilities in underground hydrogen storage. One here uh, depicted on the left, we see a salt cover. So this, uh, this salt cover is basically um, an empty space, kind of an empty space in the, in the underground that is surrounded by a salt layer that is slightly permeable uh, close to the surface of the cavern, but eventually in the order of a few meters, it becomes completely plastic. So hydrogen cannot move further away. Another possibility is to use reservoirs, so like uh, natural gas located reservoirs. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, of course, we don't have any um, large empty spaces, but we have pores in the rock where hydrogen can be stored. Now we can indeed uh, uh, characterize and reproduce uh, by models these two storages by writing material balances and all the required equations. And we would then be able to see how pressure, uh, for example, uh, the, the status and pressure of the system behaves in time. So you, you see here hydrogen pressure in times at uh, different location in the, in the rock, inside the cover and blue and the orange in the rock. And we can see the, how the cycles uh, would, uh, would then appear. We can do the same for reservoirs and we can do the same for time. So with, the, with this, uh, basically we are able to understand how the system thermodynamically behave. But now, if you want to understand how this system uh, needs to be operated and designed, then we need a different approach. What we need is to have a multi-energy system approach. So where we see uh, the, the hydrogen storage in the context of uh, the, the energy system. So when we're considering renewable sources, uh, PV panels, solar turbines, and, uh, and the end users. So when we need really to, to use hydrogen. And this can be done with the Higgs integral linear programming and uh, using the formulation of the energy, multi energy system, uh, energy hub approach. Right, so uh, here we need to, we basically what we do is to couple the availability of renewables to the energy system and to the demand. And this mathematically is done with the Higgs integral linear programming, which is formulated here. 
where we need to provide input data, we have decision variables, constraints, and objective function. Objective function being costs and emissions coupled together as again in a Pareto way. The, um, the easiest system that we can consider, and we actually consider in, in the work that is going to uh, that is mentioned here is a system where we only have renewables in terms of uh, wind turbines and PV panels that provide electricity to a power to hydrogen system that is composed of fuel cell and electrolyzer. Hydrogen is stored and then is converted to provide uh, electricity to the end user. Now, the, the key point here is that we need to transform the thermodynamic models into a linear model because this is, this is a linear approach. And one can do this with uh, mathematical tricks. And uh, you see here uh, that we are able to transform our detailed thermodynamic model into a linear uh, model that perfectly or almost perfectly resembles the detailed model. Once we have this, we can, uh, of course, investigate the system. And we did that by looking at the available storage capacity, so FMSS, maximum storage energy over annual energy demand, and the annual um, available renewable generation, so R, annual renewable generation over the annual energy. And with this, we were able to uh, identify different uh, areas where we would have different uh, um, electro electrolyzer de uh, design, so size, fuel cell design, and also operation of uh, the, the storage, bringing uh, to a certain CO2 emission. I cannot go into the details of this for the, in the interest of time, but of course, this is a, a all report in the publication mentioned here. What I would like to discuss with you is more the CO2 ISO. So we see, we were able to see that uh, for different uh, available capacity, uh, storage capacity, uh, renewable generation, we have indeed obtained different CO2 emissions. And if you really want to go into the zero uh, emission ISO lines that, are, that is required for a net zero world, we need to have a minimum combination of uh, uh, storage and renewable generation. And of course, as we move uh, to, the, to, the, to the point of zero in the renewable generation and storage, we see that we, we have more emission. This is particularly useful also to identify what are the limits. So are we uh, dealing with limits from the renewable generation perspective or are we dealing with limits from the storage perspective? All right, so again, in the interest of time, I would like to conclude here by saying that um, hydrogen will be pivotal to achieve net CO2 net zero energy system. Hydrogen will be used in different applications following the different path according to the geoeconomic contexts. And research needs to address all the remaining hurdles for the deployment of hydrogen scale in the different sectors. And these include conversion technologies, CO2 neutral production that I have discussed before, the infrastructure, the storage that I have also discussed, and the policies, of course, that are needed to, um, for implementing this. And this concludes my presentation, and I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Matteo Gazzani. We have hereby come to the end of the presentation session. Before we move on to the Q&A session, I wish to thank all the speakers one more time for their great insights during the past hour. Also, I would like to remind everybody in the audience that next week at the same time will be the next and last episode of this five-episode webinar series with the topic Hydrogen in China, Local Initiatives and Opportunities. We very much look forward to seeing you next week as well. Thank you. Now, let us move on to the live Q&A session with the simultaneous translator. Thank you very much uh, for your attention for the past one and a half hours this time. Uh, and before we start to the Q&A session, I would like to remind you, just like last time, that we have a simultaneous uh, translator present again. All right. So as you can see on the picture, uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can click on the translation function. Then you can select your preferred language, either English or Chinese. And then the third step is it's best to mute the original audio and then you will only hear the audio channel from either the speaker or the translator. Now, let us move on to the Q&A session. I've already seen that we've received quite a, quite a couple of interesting questions in the chat. 
and also uh, I prepared some topics for a possible panel discussion, but because of the expertise of our speakers, I would also love to give them as much uh, time to speak uh, as possible. So let me start with the first question uh, for Piet Wanner, who gave us the opening speech and who works for the leading uh, research institute in Netherlands, TNO, because he is very active in system integration of, of large volume wind uh, energy turbines, so also hydrogen turbines. And he also works a lot uh, with Chinese wind turbine companies. So uh, I would love Pete, Pete Wana, to uh, share some more of his experience uh, of cooperation, but also the importance of cooperation between research institutes and companies in China. Fons, thank you very much for your question. I think I am online now. You can hear me? Good. Right. It's very important for research institutes to hook up to industrial companies in order to stay hooked up to the actuality and to have research that really makes impact, as Lena said, towards next steps and towards future technology. So that is one thing why it's very important to work side by side. Working together with Chinese wind turbine manufacturers for us is very important because th through them we also get feedback from operational knowledge in, in Chinese situation. So building a hydrogen network around wind turbines could well be a solution to the next large wave of offshore wind turbines where, especially in the Netherlands in the North Sea, we are no longer able to collect all the energy into electricity. That would require a huge investment in ACDC uh, lines and conversion power conversion lines, which would connect us to the backlands of Europe, where in hydrogen we can connect to an existing pipe system. That same system could also be adopted in China in the remote areas, both onshore and offshore. So also working together there, it's, it's very important for us to make big steps forward in technology and, and to, to launch it large scale into the energy system. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. Does any of the panelists uh, would like to elaborate on this? Maybe if not from the perspective of a research institute, but maybe from the perspective of a university. So the importance of working together in the field of hydrogen between the university and a company. If I do not get a response from the uh, panelists, I would, I would like to ask this question directly to Mr. Zhang, because he mentioned a lot of applications uh, active um, in the Yangtze River Delta area from uh, Tungling, and he mentioned some specific uh, applied research as well in that area. So maybe, um, maybe he can go a little bit further into depth uh, for the Yangtze River Delta area and uh, Tungling. Uh, how important are the universities and how important are the research institutes for the development and for the plans of that region? Uh Chueha 分了三个阶段
和样传的这么一个研制工作啊，包括示范。那么在这五千多级第二阶段这个这个研发的时候啊，那么我们当然希望是二零二三啊年能完成，或者是到二零二五最多啊，不能超过二零二五。那么在万动级的研发计划里边，我们推动计划里边可能是希望二零二五进行启动，完成。那二零二五能够完成呢，最好完不成，我们希望在二零二七年之前完成啊。这是一个技术跟那我们这个这个，包括是示范啊这个过程啊，这应应该是以这个计划为推动啊来推动。呃，但是呢，就是说它分两个阶段啊，就是我说那个研发跟示范。那么在产业化推动的过程里面，实际上。呃，可能会带来一些比较大的挑战啊。呃，一个是来自于规范啊，就是船的这个这个一个规范，包括它的配套设施啊，长江上轻基础设施的一个一个配套工作。呃，还有就来自于一个成本的压力，因为就是客户的一个用户的一个商业模式的一个接受程度啊。实际上，这个时候除了技术进步，我们将来面面对的最大的挑战，实际上是来自于成本的压力啊。这个实际上是这个时间，随着时间的这个这个往后的这个，我们在延展，那么它的整个的这个燃料电池的产业啊，呃，它的成本我们希望它是快速下降啊，随着才燃，所以这个特别是在，呃，燃料电池汽车的这个大产业的推动下啊，带动下，把它整个的一个燃料电池动力系统的这个成本大幅下降啊。那么就是这样才能有力的支撑我们船用啊动力系统的这个这个，能够那个经济上呃实现呃进行有一个可行性啊，客户能够去去去进行那个采购和运营啊，这实际上这是未来这种项目里边面临最大的挑战。当然，我们整个的预算预计划里边是二零三零年我们要实现这个产业化啊，整个的这个呃。长江在那个氢能燃料电池船啊，长长江上的一个产业化运营啊，当时这个这个，因为这个计划其实做的是比较详细的。我在这个今天在这个会上时间很短，只是介绍了它最最要点的一些一些一些东西啊，就是说我们什么时间实现多少量的这个这个运营啊，什么这个其实是很很很多的一些这个具体的一些东西啊，我就这个时间关系可能要。So I.、Uh... I like to thank、uh, Mr. Zhang for his reply,、uh, and also、uh, thank Mr. Zhang for already answering、uh, the question that was asked to him in the Q and A part. Now, I would like to give a follow up question to Mrs. Yu, because、uh, Mr. Zhang、uh, mentioned that a lot of interesting project plans that are upcoming.、Um, but as we saw in Mrs. Yu's presentation, there were already some projects realized, also in cooperation with her university. Uh, and one of that is the the first hydrogen bus、uh, in China,、uh, and I think、uh, this is also a very good example of a good cooperation between the、uh, universities and,、uh, and companies. So maybe Mr. Mrs. Yu can elaborate a little bit more on that, and maybe mention some of the challenges that their team faced at the time. Uh, thank you, folks. Organizers give us、uh, this opportunity to get together to talking about the future and the hydrogen activity. And both in Netherlands and China. And for my question, I think、um, I already mentioned the first、uh, fuel cell van. That's not fuel cell bus, but we also have the first fuel cell bus in China. I assume that will be that was in 2005 and 2006 in Beijing in Tsinghua University at that time. So I saw that there was a question about、uh, the first fuel cell bus. Was the most uh, um, issue we faced at that time?、Uh, I remember、um, this. What it was just one bus, so we provide the technology to the、um, bus manufacturer, and the bus manufacturer delivered the bus to run in Zhongguan Chun area in Beijing. And most of, of our audience there. Should know that Zhongguancheng area is the most uh, uh, educated area in China. I think so. The public、uh, acceptance、uh, was very good,、uh, but at that time, the the durability of fuel cell at that time、uh, is, I think, it was the most issues. And with the time pass by,、uh, a lot of new technology、uh, comes out. Then we can have. Um, much better experience for the fuel cell vehicle in China. So 
recently, I think the most issue uh, would be the cost and the manufacturing capacity for the industrial partner. And yes, our uh, our um, we also mentioned about the, our collaboration with the industry partner. Uh, for the fuel cell, we collaborate with the uh, Anhui Mingtian um, Hydrogen Technology. In Chinese, it's called Mingtian Qingneng Youxian Gongsi. And for the PAM electrolyzer, we cooperate with um, Yangguang Dianyuan. Then um, it, was, it is a very famous um, um, manufacturer in the photovoltaic um, uh, industry. So I, I also, I already experienced our um, advantage and combine with the industrial advantage together um, from the fuel cell prototype in the lab. And we have a very good, um, we can call this product from the company. And um, we can experience the fuel cell stack from the company it already assembled into the fuel cell um, bus run in, uh, in, in Anhui right now. And in the near future, our PAM electrolyzer also will have the product uh, to demonstrate. Uh, yes, we already demonstrate our prototype in state grid right now. And in the near future, I think next year at this time, we may have a bigger, bigger PAM electrolyzer, we can see that um, can run in somewhere in China, but I can not tell you right now. That's uh, what I can see for this question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Yu, for this further elaboration. Uh, and because you mentioned risk and you mentioned electrolyzers, I would, I would like to give the next question to um, Mr. Uh, van der Burg who's also very active in the electrolyzers. And, and you mentioned there is a, a competition, as you might say, between the different electrolyzer methods, so alkaline, PM, SOE, and AEM. So from his perspective, let's say after 10 or 15 years, uh, which method of electrolyzing uh, do you think would be uh, most popular, or if you would say on top in terms of efficiency or maybe in terms of popularity. And then there's also some risk, uh, is there, uh, in case the costs remain high? And, and do you see this as a, a serious risk uh, for your research? Uh, thank you, Alphonse, for this excellent question. Uh, yeah, if, if someone would know what, what, what will be the technology over 15 years, <laughs> I think no one actually will know. But I mean, we can give so a number of scenarios. I think the first projects, uh, which will be mainly subsidized projects, that will be a combination asset between the alkaline and PEM technology. Why? Because, I mean, that technology is mature enough to build systems with 10, 10 20, 100 megawatts. So that's, that's the coming years that will be like a competition between alkaline and PEM. And up to now, alkaline is, is more in favor because there are already large systems built. Uh, if you maybe look at 2030, there will be a mix because, um, for example, uh, the PEM is really better in rapid responding, uh, so it's really be better positioned for integration. If you look for maybe a system on she uh, on the on the on the um, offshore systems, I mean, then the footprint is really important. So uh, the PEM system, PEM electrolyzer, will be really good position in, in uh, floating platforms or on, on the uh, abandoned oil platforms. So on sea, where there's a footprint issue, then the PEM is much more in favor. Yeah, and I think after 2030, we really talk about next generation, which I tried to explain in my presentation. So that will be uh, a combination of the alkaline and PEM, for example, the IM. So that will be uh, because the, the, the scarce material or even platinum is really a showstopper. So we need to find alternatives for that at IM electrolyze is really a, 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 a good potential for that, but it's still at low TRL at, at small scale. So that there are much more research and piloting needs to be done on IM. And to look at high temperature systems, the solid oxide is really interesting. I mean, if we have high temperature waste heat available, uh, 
uh, and, and we can do co-electrolysis. The solid oxide electrolyzer is really interesting on in combination with industry. So I think there won't be one technology who will be the winner. So uh, the PEM is really interesting for build environment, connecting to refueling stations, connecting offshore. Alkaline will be definitely interesting for large systems in the industry and where there's waste heat available where we want to do co-electrolysis, for example, making e kerosene then the solid oxide electrolyzer is interesting. So yeah, I think we should do research on all and I think that's best for actually the market that there are more technologies are available because that, that helps the cost reduction, which is needed. So I hope that answer your question. Thanks. I th thank you, Lemme van der Burg. You didn't really go into depth yet about the, the risk question. So I'll, I might come back to that uh, later if we, have, uh, if we have some more time. But I do have a question for Aravind. Um, a question also uh, related to his presentation and a little bit related to research that enters um, application. Because he mentioned that hydrogen cars uh, can be used as uh, power plants, if you will, small power plants. So, so let's say, uh, how, how feasible is it to use cars or maybe buses or trucks as power plants? Uh, then maybe they can make a household uh, energy independent. Uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, the Delft car park demonstration units, um, because I think there's not that much information uh, available yet. So Aravind, if, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yep. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, it's uh, quite interesting. I think uh, there is at least one car uh, within TUDEF campus which could uh, function as a car as power plants, power plant. And um, and and then um, uh, well, uh, if if you if you look at the challenges, of course, um, uh, the the stationary application, PEM fuel cells, and and the PEM fuel cells used for transportation have uh, say different lifetimes and um, and understanding the differences in the same stack and its lifetime when used in both modes uh, in order to come up with optimal designs for such such mixed use is a challenge and uh, so that's uh, that's where uh, quite a lot of research at least we are planning we had some initial studies done and, uh, and, and then uh, further research activities are planned around this. So that's one part. And um, so cars uh, are driven only a couple of hours normally per day when it's not a taxi, when it's a, when it's a private car. So you might have the opportunity to use such systems for power production uh, for longer durations uh, if you use uh, PEM fuels and powered cars. And, but on the other hand, if you look at, um, if you look at um, uh, say, uh, buses and trucks, uh, they are probably uh, continuously driven. And, and, and in such cases, of course, uh, if you want to have uh, electricity production in the night when buses are parked, it's fine. But uh, with a lot of uh, electricity requirement uh, during the daytime, uh, it's, 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 it's challenging. So it's all about um, having the 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 the, uh, uh, the right application in mind, and uh, understanding how cells work, and 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 starting to 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 build demonstrations because it's also important how these things work in practice, how people uh, adapt to such systems, and um, uh, how uh, beneficial they are in practice. So that's the stage we want to to uh, move on. So science side. It's, it's a lot about understanding degradation and managing degradation in mixed use mode. And in uh, and, and practical side, uh, building up such systems for, for, for uh, real life applications and, and learning from the experience that's thus gained. Um, so cars are much more interesting, maybe, maybe scooters, even small scale power plants, it should be no problem because if they're not used continuously, uh, but if with, with the continuously used systems, it's a bit less uh, attractive. Uh, but of course, there are opportunities and, and depending upon uh, the conditions they are used. Um, so for example, in remote islands, they might still be interesting in remote areas, et cetera. So the applications and the areas where these systems are applied need to be carefully chosen as well. Uh, but there is interest from industry. There is interest from uh, uh, automotive industry and we have uh, quite large number of uh, companies from different countries and different uh, different uh, 
continents and now uh, in discussions with us on uh, pursuing this research further. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alvind. Uh, I, would like, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Zhang or uh, Mrs. Yu, if in, in China there is a similar research, uh, like the research that Alvind mentioned, so using cars uh, as power plants. Hydrogen cars, of course. As I know, uh, not yet for the hydrogen car as a power plant. Okay, I think, oh, and maybe Mr. Zhang?这个据我了解研究是有 Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zhang and uh, Mr. Yu, for this uh, further elaboration. I do have another question for, for, Ms., for Mrs. Yu, and it's, it's related to the last one because, uh, as I just uh, learned, that in China there are not such uh, researches uh, yet. So there might be a possibility for uh, cooperation or a joint research on this with uh, Professor Alvind. And uh, I know from from our panelists a pre-discussion that there is interest. So I, I do invite you to, to further discuss this, but not at, not at this point, because I, I do have another question that misses you, because in, in your presentation, you, you did mention the, the research on the uh, AEM fuel cells, uh, and that, that you found that water management is, is crucial for the performance stability and the improvement of the AEM fuel cells. And, and you kind of already invited Dutch parties that there is a potential collaboration in that field. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit more on this and then afterwards I can maybe give the word to, to Lennart to, to apply. So, uh, Mrs. Yu. Okay, thank you for your question. And I saw there was a question about the water management in the AEM fuel cell. Uh, actually, water management in the AM fuel cell is much more complex than in the PAM fuel cell. Uh, the thing is, uh, as a cathode, the water is a uh, reactant, not the product. So for the chemist, we know if we do not have the reactant, the, the reaction cannot pre proceed. So in this point, uh, water is one of the reactions. We have to provide enough water to the reaction, then the reaction can continue. And simultaneously at the anode, the water is a product. So that means in one side, it, water takes the role as a reactant, as the other side, it uh, uh, takes the role of the product. That means we have two sides, we have to consider we have to take care of the water. So in this point, we, we can understand it's much more complex in the AM than in the PAM fuel cell. And it's also related to the chemical engineering, but also for the chemical reaction. So water management needs more attention. So we would also like to cooperate with um, the researchers uh, work well. Okay, thank you very much, this you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are nearing the end of the presentation. So before I give the last word to, to Mr. van der Berg, I would like to uh, remind everybody that we are nearing the end of the presentation. So Mr. van der Berg, what do you see uh, from the point of TNO? Some, do you see possible collaboration or maybe you see possible collaboration in, in other fields? Yeah, uh, th thanks for this question. Uh, actually, I sent uh, 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 already a, a message to the professor um, uh, because I think on the IM uh, there's definitely room for cooperation because there's still low TRL and I think we put, should put more effort on, on this, for example, to make a stable membrane. There's, a, there's an increasing interest in work on IM, so I think that's, that's definitely an area we should, we should find uh, a way to further develop uh, in this field, so that, so I think uh, after this webinar we should start the interaction. Uh, uh, yeah, on this. Yeah. 
Thanks. And maybe maybe on your last question, you, you say about the risk on electrolysis. One risk I see, uh, I mean, you, we've got also the low carbon option, uh, blue hydrogen, so the SMR with CCS storage. And I think uh, if we're not able to, to, to fast and uh, go to cost reduction for green hydrogen electrolysis, I think that, that there won't be a market. That we, because we should also see scenarios where as SMR we're compi combining with CCS or, or methane pyrolysis um, have a better advantage for electrolysis. So the cost reduction is really crucial to actually uh, yeah, make this all happen. So that's, that's, that's definitely a risk if we're not able to, to reach that, that, that cost reduction and that scale. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Leonard. I, I think that also gives a very good link, uh, connection to our next webinar uh, for next week at the same time, which will be about uh, opportunities in China. Because uh, as we all know, if, if scaling works, there's more money made, prices will go down. So next week we'll discuss opportunities in China with uh, several key cities and key projects and their opportunities um, and local initiatives. So I wish to thank all the speakers for their presentations and for their answers in the Q&A and of course for the presence during the live chat as well. And also thank you for the audience, especially for the audience in China because it's already past six and still many people are watching the webinar. So thank you and we hope to see you next week at the same time again. Thank you very much.